include the, the growth track and, and this track's morning strong with a panel. Uh, I'm going to welcome to stage my young assistant, not assistant, I don't know, what's well, this? Well, Charlie, come to the stage, I don't know what to say. My young Padawan, who, who's going to host this. Um, this track, I remember, is sponsored by um, Game Changers SF, and the, you should uh, talk to them about uh, advertising marketing needs. They are, I think they have a booth outside as well, and they're going to be on this panel, so you can ask them questions direct. Do you want to welcome your panelists? Not yes, of course. Uh, cool. So could my uh, lovely panelists come up uh, to the stage? That's uh, Matt Sharp, uh, Stephanie, Brendan, Walder, and Eric. Oh, please welcome them, guys. <laughs> That's why I'm standing here. So, hi everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to the last panel of the uh, growth track. Uh, my name is Charlie and I'm part of the marketing team at Steel Media. I'm in uh, by no means an expert on marketing, but that's why I'm here to learn from these lovely experts. Uh, so uh, before we kick off with uh, my extensive list of questions, um, I would like to uh, welcome the panelists to uh, introduce themselves. Uh, so if you could uh, just introduce uh, yourself, uh, what you do, and uh, maybe a fun fact, you know, it's, it's, that might be nice. Uh, so uh, yes, if you want to start off, Stephanie. Now am I on? Okay, there we go. Um, so my name is Stephanie Greenall. I am the head of marketing at Tilt 5. We bring friends and family together through holographic gaming. Um, in short, that is we have a hardware system where we bring on third-party games and turn them into holograms, similar to Dejaric and Hollow Chess, if you've seen those in Star Wars. Um, fun fact... Um, I have been tasked with taking a lot of the uh, Americans that have come up for poutine because that's all that they want when they come here. <laughs> so, so that's my point. That's fair enough. Uh, my name is Matt Sharp. I'm the creative director in advertising at Zynga. We are a mobile games publisher who have the privilege of entertaining over 250 million players across the world. Um, that's my fun fact. 250 million times. <laughs> That's a big number. Um, and it, frankly, if like real talk, just to start, it's a lot of pressure when you're speaking to that many people. Um, but you'll learn a lot. And so I hope to discuss that today. Hello. I'm Eric Hartness. I'm the vice president for Game Changer SF. We're a full service performance marketing agency. It was recently acquired by Pixis. And we're now incorporating Pixis AI into our UA efforts to help optimize and, and automate performance marketing. I've been in the business. I guess that's my fun fact. I've probably been in here longer than anybody. I started EA in 2000 and have worked for EA, Bandai Namco, Amazon Game Studios, and a, and a few other companies in the uh, video game industry. Hey everyone, I'm Brendan O'Connor. I work at Maloco, Director of Implementation. So what we do is we launch a bunch of new titles uh, when people join. Maloco is a machine learning company, and as that applies to everyone in this room, we use that to drive positive user acquisition outcomes um, for our customers, some of which we've worked with a few of the companies on this panel. Um, fun fact, despite having three plus Canadian stamps in my passport, this is the first time I have left Pearson. <laughs> Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Walder Amaya, uh, CEO and co-founder of uh, Apex Mobile Media. Specifically, uh, we have a division called Apex Gaming Network, and what we are is we exclusively represent in the Canadian market the likes of EA Game, Assyrian, Audio Mob. Our focus is to bring best-in-class gaming technologies to the Canadian market and help them monetize against branded clients. Uh, and how do we evangelize the Canadian market in terms of the powerful audiences that gaming environments have. Fun fact about myself, um, I usually, when I've done this in, in, at the Pocket Gamer in London, I usually get a cold or warm reception. I'm a huge Manchester United fan. Yes, <laughs> yes. So you're both myself and Chris are Everton fans. So. <laughs> Boo. 
<laughs> but yes, uh, thank, thank you so much, guys. Um, so uh, we'll launch right in. Uh, I hope you don't mind. Uh, so um, the panel is about uh, you know marketing tricks to uh, you know attract the right audience. So my first question is, what are some of the effective strategies for identifying the audience that you want to target? Mm -hmm. Who wants to take that one first? Don't be shy. I can take that on from our end. I think that from, from a panel standpoint, I'm looking at it from a different perspective where I'm coming in and helping game developers or the partners that they're working with and how to monetize their inventory. Um, one of the things that we're seeing a lot right now, and we're seeing this across the major five hold codes that probably run 80% of all the media advertising worldwide. What we're seeing is that they, are ha they have created specific gaming divisions where they see the power of gaming, and by that I mean audiences that are actually gaming. If we look at statistically, the time spent gaming is now outpacing time that people are actually watching television. However, the media spend is not keeping up with that percentage. So part of what we're doing is evangelizing specifically for the Canadian market, evangelizing our clients, our branded clients, the likes of American Express, the likes of Ford, the likes of McDonald's for that matter, on the power of the audiences. Because the traditional mentality, uh, traditional mentality of a gamer is that 18 year old, 17 year old kid sitting in the basement, you know, drinking Mountain Dew, eating Cheetos. That's not it. When we look at the data, we see that 53% of the Canadian overall market, 40 million people plus in Canada now, that 53% uh, of them are actually gaming at least four times a month for over two and a half hours. So when you wanna find that audience, this is the channel and the mechanism that you should be looking at. And that's a broad spectrum. Everything, I have an 11 year old daughter, everything from Roblox or Minecraft, all the way across to you know, my mother who's 73 years old and she games. She's playing games on her phone all the time. And you know, she doesn't really understand what I do, but she always tells me, she's like, <laughs> you're the one that gives me those ads on my game. So I think that from, our, from my perspective, from where I'm looking at it, or from where we look at it is identifying the target audience that those brand advertisers want and be able to work with our partners in order to create those audience segments at scale depending on what they want to do. The beautiful part about the gaming world right now is that it has evolved so much in terms of, it's not just that invasive banner ads. Now you have rewarded video, you have audio ads, you have uh, in-game ads. So think about digital out of home. So those of you that came in from Pearson Airport, the billboards that you see here, now we're able to embed those billboards right within games and be able to collect useful data. So it's not just, you know, uh, using panels. Now we have specific data that allows us to quantify and justify that media spend, thus helping gaming publishers to continue working and building better games. I would, I would, I would expand on that a little bit. I think you touched it right on the head when you said, you know, data is going to determine this and it's going to be the Absolutely. biggest thing. You might build your game with the expectation that, oh, this is going to be for a core audience of 15 to 30 year old really hardcore gamers, but if the data doesn't back that out, you need to recognize that reality and you can still monetize and still drive engagements with these audiences that may not be your traditional expectation of what a gaming audience is. Because you know, in the last ten, 10 years, I remember the same thing you just said, we would be in meetings with large brands and they would say, oh, I'm not playing mobile games. No, that's just a bunch of kids. Yeah. Well, none of these guys have ever ridden the subway and seen Everyone from every age demographic, every type of person out there is all sitting on their phones playing games. And so understanding that your audience might not be what you expect it to be, but using the data to identify what that is and taking advantage of that with these larger brands that are now starting to understand that everyone plays mobile games. I have a kind of a funny story to add on to that. So, you know, we've recently integrated AI into our, into our targeting and, and, and performance marketing. And the um, director of marketing that we were working with, she, she, you know, it was the AI was going after a different market than what her market was. You know, like you said, it's this market with this demographics, yada, yada, yada. And she just couldn't grasp that the AI was doing something different, but it was producing. Mm -hmm. It was but it was like, that's not our target market. I know that, you know, back in EA, we used to have these, you know, full on processes that we'd go through to identify the target market. And you just like, 
go over and over, and Frank Jabot would go, no, that's not it. You know, I'd have to go back and do it over again. Yeah. <laughs> and so, but, but it was just so funny because it was, it was generating the revenue. It was, it was meeting the KPIs, but it was a totally different market. And, and it just you got to let yourself follow the data is the point. And if the data's working, then you got to adapt your, your um, you know, thinking and your resources to, f to follow that. Are we going sequentially? Is that like, am I next in line? Yeah, Is that yeah. okay? I just wasn't sure the format. Yeah, I, I was yeah, just absolutely. like, okay, here's the thing. <laughs> I'm the creative director. Audience segmentation, I'm not gonna get into the weeds because that's not my day to day. I will say, for all the talk about, we've come a long way, people don't think of gamers in the basement. I find they still do. I find they very much, and so I was meeting with a friend of mine. She is insanely talented, very high up uh, on the media side at Pepsi. And I'm like, why aren't you doing more with certain companies? Not us, thankfully. And um, she's like, well, because when I think of a gamer, I think of, yes. what was it? Cheetos? Yeah. Basically. Okay. Mountain, Mountain Dew? Dew. Yeah. Okay. And the thing is, I find sometimes, I was at another panel and we're in this echo chamber where we're like, oh, thank God no one thinks that anymore. Oh, yes, they do. Yeah. Oh, yes, they do. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, if you're a brand, that is opportunity. Whenever there's underpriced attention, there's opportunity. Take advantage of it. That's my contribution to this sequential order. I hand the baton yeah, to you. Um, so we started off in a Kickstarter in 2019, and everyone was like, oh shit, what the hell is this thing? Um, that we had created essentially this game board that produced holograms. Um, so we had like this built-in audience when we started because when Kickstarter goes wild, like we were the we're still, I think, the largest Kickstarter of all time. Uh, for augmented reality. And so we had this baked in kind of community and audi audience. So the kind of the topics that we knew that we wanted to cover, the D&Ds, the RPGs, and certain kind of genres we know would work really, really well on the system, um, which was one part, which was great, and then you get to foster that community. But, you know, you have to follow the data. And I 100% agree, like, for any of those, like, indie devs who have, like, peanuts, for a marketing budget, um, which I'm sure there's tons of people here at this conference, um, it's definitely going through the data and, and following that. And there's free reports, there's articles, there's all of that stuff where you essentially, sometimes you do just throw spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks and then run with it. Um, recently I had been working on a report that I was giving out to investors and the number one growing demographic in the gaming industry, which I haven't heard mentioned yet, was grandparents. And I was like, grandma's now picking up an Xbox controller. She's going to pick up my controller that's super intuitive. And she's going to be able to play with the kids. So understanding that, that makes you pivot. And that's not your basement dweller. Um, it's, it's the kids with their grandparents that are playing together. And that's our market. So we have to pivot to that. So that's where, where we're at. Brilliant. Stephanie, you mentioned about um, indie developers. And uh, you gave great advice about um, you know, free reports and everything. So anything else that you would like to... Uh, suggest to indie developers that they can use? I would say social media is your friend. Um, fostering that community, for me, for everything that I've ever really done has been like Discord, social media, meetups, like getting people to test your products. We do a lot of like guerrilla marketing where I just show up to places. Like I'm not even <laughs> supposed to be on this panel. Um, and I'll just show up and like start talking to people or giving them demos and that's yeah. been the best way to do it is you, you get in people's faces and then at one point they'll start listening. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Anyone else want to add to that on the indie developer front? No? I can move on to the next question. That's absolutely fine. Um, so circling back to uh, mobile apps. Uh, so uh, what strategies or techniques can you employ to create user engagement within those mobile apps? Is there something that you've, you've done specifically yourself or your partners that you've worked with seen have been very effective? Um, everything is a conversation. When you think of everything as a conversation, things just open up. And what I mean by that is, I think a lot of times people get so tied up in their design patterns and this and this, they lose the personality as part of that. And they see hyper casual titles, they're like, that's big, I'll copy that, I'll do that, fast follow, this and this. No matter what you do, no matter what you say in your platform, you are always having a conversation with somebody and you need to be mindful of that. 
What are you trying to say on this screen? What are you trying to say as part of this workflow? How do you need to say that? And I think it sounds so foundational and it's funny because sometimes I speak about indie developers, I'll meet with them and they're like, oh, you, you simplify it. That sounds so simple. It's like, well, then why aren't you doing it? Why aren't you doing it? Because I look, a lot of times people will be like, yeah, check out my app and I'll check it out and I'll look at it and it's like, you hit me with an ad within the first 30 seconds. Hi, nice to meet you. You want to buy something? I have a great game. Hold on, I'll tell you. You want to buy that? You want to buy that? You want, look, I'm in advertising. I want to see more ads, but not at the expense of user experience because when that happens, you're yelling into a void. No one, you swore, so I'll swear. <laughs> no one will give a shit what you or your brand partners are saying if they're not there to hear it. I'll, I'll, I'll piggyback a little bit on that. We see it all the time um, with our partners that run their games uh, on our platform. And the ones that integrate their marketing efforts into their live ops, they integrate on the other side, on the publishing side, the ad integration isn't just throwing you everything. You still have to make a good and engaging game. And what we see from our advertisers is those placements and when you build your advertising stack within your title to be conducive to a user experience, you will make more money. Throwing out more ads into your game is not always gonna be the solution to a higher monetization. Because at the end of the day, everyone who's buying these, for the most part, we, they, they care about performance. And if you integrate a strong ad unit into your game that is not intrusive to your user, you keep that user within your title, as well as monetize um, by those conversion rates increasing. Uh, I'll add to that. From our end, um, less is more. It's that experience. And as a brand advertiser, you want your brand associated with a positive experience. So you are playing the game. It's a positive experience. It reinforces the positive brand affinity that you want to create with that audience. We don't think of that sometimes. And we've worked with a number of gaming publishers that, as it was said here, they literally just throw ads everywhere. And we've run brand lift studies. And what we have found is that the brand affinity within those games where shit's just getting thrown at the user goes way down. No brand wants to be associated with that, regardless whether it's a shooting game or whatever it is. So what I, my suggestion is less is more, number one. Number two, be very strategic. If we look back at the genesis of advertising, so, uh, soap operas, why was it? P&G came in and they basically embedded it. It was part of the experience. Think of it in the same manner. It's very, very simple. I think that sometimes we overthink this. Um, Number one, Num uh, sorry, number three, uh, the other thing that I will add to that is part of that experience is try to reward the user for the more time that they're spending in playing your game, whether that is rewarded video, that it, whether that is associating the brand with you get to a certain level and you got to watch the ad or you got to interact with the brand in some way, shape or manner, um, embed it within the game experience performs extremely well. And these are the types of things that brand advertisers want to see. This is also part of the, the, the thinking from the conversations that we've had with major brands and their agencies. Part of the thinking is, is well, we see that those banner ads everywhere, or maybe they have a game and they, they get bombarded by ads. Well, let's be specific. Let's curate a list of specific games that target that audience, depending on the data and the demographic profile that you want to target, and let's start testing it, and let's make sure that we're embedding this. And this is a lot of what we're doing, where we're working with our partners, we're working with game, gaming publishers, where we're actually saying, let's go beyond the banner, let's go beyond the video, and actually, how can we embed the brand within the game and create that overall holistic user experience? Anyone else want to add to that? Or that all good cool uh you basically just answered two of my questions in one then so it's like oh i'll scrap that one then um so uh just moving on to specifically more ad formats um so are there any uh, specific ad formats that perform well against a player who's new to a game via ua spend yes rewarded yeah people here reward it's funny I, I talk to brands i talk to our partners you know what they still say i feel like i'm bribing the player <laughs> no Here's the thing with rewarded. People want to talk about native ads and they think I'm talking about in-game advertising. Okay, we're here and there's a big Zynga logo flashed on the wall and no one notices because it's intrinsic. No, rewarded is native to an experience. Yeah. So 
when Jimmy is on level two and needs to get to level three and he needs 40 gems, but he doesn't have the money, he can watch a 30 second video ad, 15 second ad, and he gets it. And guess what? You've helped him. You've helped create momentum. Now, in terms of how to deploy that, you know, select it. Well, you know what? I won't have to get into all that. Oh, I'll go pass it on. I don't know. See, the thing is, I could talk about this stuff all day, and I want to make sure everyone's got equal time. Well, player studies, too, show that the players are like that, so they don't have to pay. You know, so the, the rewarded videos and other, those other types of activities are actually, you know, beneficial to the experience for certain players. Here's a counterpunch for you. But, but people just put their phones away. They hit reward and they tuck it away. What do I do? You got two seconds. Fix your creative. Yeah, yeah. What do I do? Yeah. No, you have an opportunity. Here's the thing. You're not guaranteed a relationship. You're guaranteed an introduction. This is Tim. If it, they look at Tim and they're, sorry, if anyone here is named Tim? <laughs> they, <laughs> someone's like, you asshole. I do my best. Um, if you look at Tim and you're like, no, don't like it, which most people are inclined to do in that situation, yeah, they'll turn their phone. However, if you come clear and concise with what you're about, you're going to reach the people who need to hear it. It's hard, it's difficult, but when you can make that work in those two seconds, worth it. Yeah, and it's a win-win, right? You want to build your ad formats to be win-win for your user base, right? To reward them, to give them that continuation to be sticky. Otherwise, they would have put down their phone, right? If they didn't have enough gems to continue on to level three, that phone's going down anyway. So now you've kept them in your title, you've kept them engaged, and for the both performance advertisers who want to see conversions, as well as brand advertising, who we pretend isn't performance, it's still performance, it's just different metrics. Uh, they want a positive experience, and you've been able to provide that with them for both your user and the advertiser. And so just being strategic and intelligent with your placements in that way, it's a win-win for everyone involved. Uh, I'll emphasize that. Rewarded video, rewarding type of interactions is key. I'll, I'll give you some numbers on this where we run A-B testing. When you do, and we've done this, we actually did it with EA, an intrusive ad unit with no reward, with the X on the top corner to close it. We saw about 85% of users closing it, right? When you make it rewarded, as you know, the other panelists just mentioned here, we see 95% completion because you're giving that user something in return for their time, okay? And you're creating a positive brand experience where now, whether it's PNG, we did this with head and shoulders, whether it's head and shoulders now targeting males, well, guess what? Now it's a positive brand experience that you just created where PNG just allowed me to get to the next level as opposed to f forcing it down their throat. Yeah, someone who's not doing mobile games, um, we do have different ad strategies and, and right now we're working through like a lot of social media ads and how we've kind of stood out is we like to play with the trolls a lot and that has seemed to, to help any time that someone has made a inappropriate comments we make an even worse one um but that there's has, a line right there. <laughs> there's a, there's to a be line. honest i've just been told to do whatever and we haven't found the line <laughs> um but you know we're careful um but that's been a lot of fun and and when you do engage with people and whether they're fans of yours or not sometimes you can convert them um, if you have fun and it's a lot of it goes back to like the KFC mentality. Like if, if you, if you're really familiar with that brand and we watch our ads, we watch what people are saying, we will comment on people's comments and that has brought in, um, our metrics are a lot of people asking certain questions and, or going to certain pages on our website and that has, that has increased things and it's, it's been a, a fun strategy to do, which is great. <laughs> Cool, cool. Uh, you just mentioned that you don't do mobile, so this question might be a little bit like, <laughs> oof. <laughs> but um, make something so, up. <laughs> yes. Um, so I'm gonna c circle back to something that uh, Chris James mentioned earlier in his uh, opening address, uh, and that is about uh, you know the dreaded IDFA stance and all that. Um, so Apple are further clamping down on that with their own um, SCAD network or SCAN and uh, Google are releasing their own privacy sandbox later this year. How will that impact marketing strategies? Oh, I'll go. <laughs> um, for us, one of the things we've noticed and, and sort of 
it's, it's all nascent. Everyone is still figuring it out, for better or for worse, from what I can gather. Um, but it's changing a little bit of, uh, at least for the relevance of this room, it's changing the development life cycles. You have to put a lot more into that day one um, to gather data points that you think are going to be valuable for those long-term um, users, right? Because previously you would have up to D7, D14. You could look at whole user life cycles, put that into, put that back with your marketing partners and tell who was good and who was bad, which channels provided long-term value, which ones provided short. Well, now you've got to get very, very smart about what behaviors users make within those first few days in order to identify positive ROI channels that are going to actually drive long-term value for you, which is a, a not always the easiest thing to do. It's the Apple essentially has turned up the difficulty knob on everybody and added a lot of stuff that people will have to put into their games in order to effectively market them. And given that UA is such a huge part of the mobile games industry, um, big shifts are coming with that, right? You're absolutely right. And we're seeing that on our end. And part of what we're, it's almost going back to basics with contextual relevant type of environments. Um, with that comes a whole set of testing out whether that campaign is working, whether that contextual or what you thought or what we thought was a contextual relevant environment for that brand to be in, whether that is working. And if it's not, being able to have other options to either expand further, be able to create scale, do some A-B testing. Um, there's a lot, and depending on the market, like here in the Canadian market right now, the, in Quebec, the privacy laws that are about to come into play in Quebec are, if you thought GDPR in Europe was tough, <laughs> what's coming down the line in Quebec puts GDPR, makes them look like a little child, okay? The Canadian government over the, for next year is coming out with different uh, regulations. So we're almost going back to basics. So for example, is you wanna target a male 18 to 34, well, what are the types of games that they're playing? So this is where, the, to your point, the data that is game publishers or game developers are collecting from the offset allows us to start creating those sets so that we can go in and sort of start catering and really start testing. That's at the stage where we're at right now until something else comes along that gives us the insights that we that we had up to maybe six months ago, a year ago. Um, that's the process in which we're going right now. Anyone else want to add, Eric? Yeah, so um, a couple things. One is going back to the, you know, like I said, I've been in marketing for over 20 years and you used to have the four Ps and all these other things that you used to do. And so we're, we're seeing a lot of our clients go back to some of those traditional tactical things, you know, the high level strategy. Um, you know, the social leveraging the social media, leveraging the PR, going going back and trying to do the full gamut, not just paid user acquisition. I mean, that's that's how we make our money is off paid user acquisition, but it's, you know, the influencer marketing is, is really helping out too. But it's all a uh, components of an overall strategy, not just one or the other. You can't really just cherry pick. You've got to go back and do it all. And one of the things that we're doing right now too, we're seeing a lot of our clients is focus a lot more on the creative. You know, we've got, we got lazy on the creative and we're throwing up things that had nothing to do with the game, you know, to, to track people, to do the tricks, as you were saying, and, 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 and they were seeing that to start to wane off. And it's really focusing on, on good creative that appeals to the game, that, that appeals to the gamer that has a real connection to the game and following that all the way through the funnel, you know, the, 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 the app store icon, the video on the page, the screenshots, and then getting into the FTUI, making sure that the initial creative they see is coordinated, and that helps them get down the funnel. And we're seeing good returns from that. Um, I'll, I'll stop there and let <laughs> someone else pick up. Matt or something, anything you guys want to add, or are you all good on that front? Do I DFA in that? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Um, so, you know, influencer marketing was just mentioned and um, obviously that's another great way to uh, target audiences. Um, what, what, is, is there a, like a specific role that influencer marketing plays or like have you seen like ex examples of where it's gone good, where it's gone bad uh, when it comes to marketing a game? Tread carefully. That's what I would always <laughs> say. Um, there are lots of them out there. Everyone wants to play your game. Everyone wants to get their hands on your hardware, which is great. Um, 
but you don't know what that return on investment is going to be. And I always kind of use this example back in the day where um, there's this model, Kate Upton, beautiful woman, Bobby Brown wanted to do, uh, which is a makeup company, wanted to do a campaign with her, spent all their money on this one egg in this basket, and they couldn't figure out why their sales didn't go up. It's because most of her audience were 13-year-old boys. <laughs> and so when you are researching your influencers or content creators, make sure it is the right content. If it's a specific game, a specific genre, make sure they're the right person. Um, because that's when you could spend all your money and, and get into a lot of trouble. And especially for indie studios, I would say don't go for the big influencers. Go for a lot of micro influencers. Get a lot of different people who have smaller followings. Um, they'll be cheaper. Sometimes you can um, negotiate other deals. Sometimes they just want to do it for fun. Um, and, and that will play into your SEO. You know, when you Google you know, a name of a game, there's going to be a lot more videos versus just one. Um, so that would be, you know, and, and build those relationships. Like you, you were saying about conversation, whether it's your influencers, your content creators, your, your audience that you're working with, treat them like humans, like talk to them like they're people. Um, marketing in this industry, developers and the gaming audience can smell bullshit faster than any other industry. So don't even try. <laughs> that would be my thing. Yeah, so there's a, uh, I don't know if anybody listens to the podcast This Week in Gaming, but just, I, I would highly recommend it. Several friends are on it, um, but they just did a podcast recently on influencers and talked about Pedro Pascal and the Jonas Brothers and um, the woman, uh, I can't remember the actress, but uh, for Mansion, um, anyway, huh? Yes, yes, that's it, exactly, thank you. Join the panel. Um, <laughs> Need more people. But anyway, they, they, I can't remember all the stats they used, but they actually talked about the stats and, and integrating some of those players into the actual game. Some of them, like one example was they just kind of used the faces in the ads and then there was no integration in the game and they saw a massive drop off. But another one of them, and I wish I could remember the exact people for which game but another one it was integrated and they saw a massive lift and they saw retain engagement from it but they also talked about how expensive that was and they don't really know what the are the you know the, the twig people didn't know the what what the ROI was but it's it's very very expensive to use those types of influencers and the micro influencers can get you a lot uh, more bang for your buck especially depending on you know where you are in your in your life cycle as a developer and publisher Anyone else want to add? Brennan, I see you. I see you. Maybe. No, they said everything that I was going to say. I, wanted, <laughs> I, wanted to, I wanted to emphasize what they said. The audience, that your actual audience is what matters, yeah. I, I think was more important. Because people will see it, you said. They'll see Kate up and be like, oh, this is perfect for my brand. Well, who's actually watching this? <laughs> right? Who's actually following this person? I see so many mobile game ads on uh, as sponsorships for YouTube videos that I watch. I'm a history dork. I watch tons of history YouTube videos. I am that target audience, and it's pretty easy to recognize, you know, 37-year-old males, but that's not always going to be the case, and so make sure that if you are getting involved, do your research and do not put all your eggs in one basket. Cool. Uh, so we've got, like, just over five minutes left, and I've realized I've been hogging all the questions, so I would like to invite the audience. Uh, does anyone have any questions that they'd like to ask our panelists? Yep, yeah, one at the back there. Hi, thank you. This was great. Uh, lots of fun. Um, talking about earlier in the panel, uh, underserved opportunities were mentioned. So UA, I mean, is getting tough. I mean, we're in a hyper competitive space. Uh, just curious if you had, uh, I don't know, any guidance or like ideas for like underserved opportunities for like indie developers in the mobile space or, or beyond. So would love I, to hear that. I do. I'll take that one. Um, 100%. The advice I would give is distilled to its principles, the same thing with a lot of large scale campaigns in that there's three components to your ad. Whenever you're serving something up, there's going to be three components. Number one, there's declaration. So people take that literally sometimes. Declaration could be value proposition. Number one, chair manufacturer, North America. It could be, you know, number one puzzle game 
or it could be in the form of a challenge if you have a playable. It could be, can you solve this before time runs out? That says to the user, they magically fill in the blanks based on what they see, based on what they think. Oh, okay, challenge, puzzle, this, they'll put it in. So number one is the declaration, number two is the demonstration. So you move past declaration, you get into demonstration, and that's where you show the game, and everyone's seen this. You, know, the, you have the playable ads that are actually videos. So the lot will play, they'll do a five, 10 second run, they'll show you the experience. So you need to demonstrate reinforcement of the declaration. Finally, delivery. When the game's over, when the demonstration's over, how are you keeping the conversation going? Do you have a prime call to action? What's your KPI against this campaign? Is it an install? Is it a get people in the funnel? So declaration, demonstration, delivery, a lot of UA ads, when you leverage that, when you consider that as your guiding pillars in executing, I find you tend to be in a way better place with respect to conversations than we're gonna do what they do and show you know, something that may or may not be our actual gameplay. Or that could be, because we talk about that two second thing, you know what everyone loves to do? Take shortcuts. Oh, we'll go salacious, skimpy clothing. Oh, we'll go lewd act, we'll do something, we'll just turn the volume up. No, that's lazy. Declaration, demonstration, delivery. I hope that helps. Does anyone have any other questions? One at the front end. Thank you. Um, my question was, this was a point that was brought up earlier in the panel, but we were talking about the fact that some ads may be the moment you open an app, right? So my question is, why hasn't there been a regulation or a policy <laughs> that was made? <laughs> this is coming from an ignorant youth who, who's just entering this industry, but I'm, I'm very curious. I'm part of an IAB working panel on addressing that. Uh, you know, IAB, you know, the, okay. Yeah, um, believe me, believe me, it's on a lot of people's minds. The problem is <sighs> when you're drafting definitions for um, standards, it's complicated, but it's underway. I can say that. That's my response. Let's go. Yeah. I would. <laughs> I would add it's gotten a lot better lately <laughs> than, it was, uh, than it was a little bit ago, although it's starting to shift back. I don't know if we're ever going to get a true regulation in that sense. I think the IAB will be, um, seems to be where we, where we take these things, but um, you know, they're a little bit behind from my experience and they're catching up to the mobile space and the mobile space keeps moving forward. So um, you guys have probably seen there's no standard size for what an X button should look like on video ads these days. Um, that would be something that I think we need to work and push towards. Um, but again, I'd, why there's no regulation, uh, I wouldn't say that, I don't know, I, I live in the US, I wouldn't say that our Congress at least has any idea what we do for a living. <laughs> I will say this quickly, because I know we're running out of time though, I will say, there tends to be an evolutionary process to this too. The yes. people who, you know that, man, I, I get stuck in my head, Taylor Swift, karma. Karma is my boy, like it's all about karma, right? Karma is her boyfriend, and karma is gonna set you, it's true. Honestly, it's true. I can't say people don't come in, they work the app charts, they spike for a week, they make a little D0, D7 revenue, but man, you weed out the bad actors real quick. Yeah. Um, and I think some companies, I won't name names, have been fined quite significantly for some not so great advertising practices. I'll just say that, a little positivity to round that one out. <laughs> to further, further to that point from our end, um, to I think answer your question, we start weeding out those games out of the list right away. Um, performance is complete garbage. Um, it's a wasted impression. And as a brand advertiser, they don't want to spend their money. They want to see for every dollar that I'm putting into the grinder, what's delivering on the back end. And that's a blessing on the cur and the curse of the digital world where we can basically track everything to the back end. Uh, yeah, one question over there. It's probably going to be our last one. Uh oh, Russell. Hello, <laughs> nice to see you all. My name is Russell. <laughs> Thank you for your panel. Welcome to Toronto. I just had a question. There's some consolidation happening in the um, ad delivery network space with yes. like Unity and Iron Source becoming yeah. one company now. And so I just wanted to ask you what your thoughts are on better competition in that space or th if the consolidation is better for what's happening on the, the end user side. From our end, consolidation is better. It allows us to bring together quality gaming publishers under one umbrella. And from our end, um, unless you're a big, big publisher, um, we're usually working with 
a company that you're working to represent you or monetize that inventory. So for us, it's better. Um, what I will say is that a lot of ad gaming solutions that have come to the table over the last little while, it was extremely fragmented. Um, there was a lot of VC money being poured into ad tech over the last four years. And what we are seeing is that a lot of those investors are not coming back and saying, where's, where's my money? What is going on? I can tell you from my end, and like I mentioned before, we only operate in the Canadian market. We are getting pinged left, right, and center right now by a lot of smaller ad tech delivery companies looking, f you know, can we merge? Can we work together? Can we do more of this type of stuff? So once again, and I think it was mentioned earlier, it's uh, the system starts to weed itself out. The stronger, solid business models that were actually generating revenue and doing well, not just for the brand advertisers, but as well as for the gaming publishers, uh, they're the ones that are sticking around. And my gut feeling is that over the next 12 months, we will probably see a lot more mergers and or companies uh, falling off to the side. And this doesn't just apply to the gaming world. We're seeing this happening across the ad tech world right across the board at this moment in time. Absolutely. I would, I would just add a little bit to that. Um, you know, with consolidation, it, it might not necessarily be good or bad, but it, it changes things, yeah. right? So if you look, you know, five, eight, ten years ago, uh, on the UA side, your value prop as a, as, a, as, a, as a partner was like, oh, I have access to this inventory or that inventory. Well, consolidation has kind of made that null and void. Like supply to a certain extent does, is on the path to commoditization. Yeah. Um, so as such, as someone at M Maloka, we work exclusively with, uh, with advertisers and UA buyers, you know, we don't have a pitch now to say, hey, we have exclusive inventory or we can access this publisher that you couldn't before. So our entire, you know, business model is, is based on, okay, well now we're going to use math, we're going to use machine learning to try and, uh, you know, outsmart <laughs> the other people that you might be spending money with, even if it is on the same publishers, right? We, there's very little chance that our algorithms and someone else's algorithms are going to find the exact same user to bid request for your title, uh, which wasn't the case before, but now we have to fight over that, whereas before you'd have exclusive access to that inventory. So it shifts who you work with and it shifts the, the partners and how they operate, um, but at the, at the end of the day, it doesn't necessarily mean it's good or bad. You just have to change your, your mentality towards how you're marketing. Cool. Thank you so much, guys. Give hey, them a Charlie, round of Charlie, can I just say one oh, thing? Okay. Hold on. No, one Hold on. Quick I'm sorry. One, I just want to say quick one thing. One. I just want to say one thing to round things out because I got to leave after this and I can't stick around to talk to anyone. And it's <laughs> this. I know there's a lot of um, developers, there's a lot of indie people here who are kind of looking, who are very ambitious to work in gaming. And I want to say one thing to you. This is just a suggestion. Two pillars that have really benefited me are opportunity and accountability. The opportunity to quickly deploy new ideas, solutions, um, things into the world and accountability, which is the tough part, not everyone loves, to where if you win, congrats, you get to keep the keys a little longer and do it again, but if you lose, you better fix it. And the reason why I wanna mention this is this, I've been at Zynga for over 10 years, which is ridiculous in this industry. Nobody does that. And I'm saying that to you because I have two very kind individuals who literally just sat through the entire panel who are coworkers of mine and I want to say thank you, and it's indicative of the kind of organization we are. And if opportunity and accountability, if any of that resonates with you on your way to lunch, swing by the Zynga panel, talk to these two nice individuals, because we need more talented people on board to do what we need to do. That's all. Charlie, thank you so much, man. And Take thank care. you to our panelists. Thank you so much. You can catch them on Meet to Match and throughout the conference and everything, and I'll give it back to the master, I guess. Thank you. Well, good job. We did well, didn't we? Give a round of applause to Charlie there, yeah. yeah.